Well, more action in the Premier League on Sunday. Two games in particular I want to talk about alongside Janusz Mihalik. You'll get to Chelsea against Brighton shortly. That had five goals, but the one I want to start with, Janusz, had seven goals. It should have had more. It was Liverpool four, Fulham three. And I don't know where Liverpool are going to finish at the end of the season, but they might look back on this game when they were 3-2 down with three minutes to go and still got all three points as one where their mentality was really tested and they came through. Well, absolutely. And, you know, if you look at Liverpool, it should have never gotten uh, uh, that far, really, when you think about it. The way they started, the way, you know, they took the lead twice. And, and really, uh, uh, you know, Fulham was, uh, were scoring goals against the run of play. It fell that way. I don't want to take anything away from Fulham because, you know, they almost pulled it off, at least a point, you know, maybe even three. So, but, you know, that spirit exists, doesn't it? You know, this is a Liverpool sa side who I still feel they're kind of looking for their old or new identity, whatever it is. And at times, it's almost as if uh, Jurgen Klopp is trying to recover a, each player by themselves to get to that level. But look where they are in the table. Uh, they're not a complete team, which we saw today throughout. But the spirit of Anfield, the spirit of the players, the want mm -hmm. uh, to win the game at all costs continues to be there. And there are many teams in the league that aren't like that. Mentality monsters if you like. But let's look a little bit more in depth into this game because two wonderful goals for Liverpool after a stoppage in play at the start of the game because of a head injury to Bernd Leno that you wondered if it would just take the sting out of the game. But it had a good tempo and it was, it was pretty open. But Fulham did more with less of the ball than Liverpool did with more of the ball. So there's no point in saying is that a concern for Jurgen Klopp. They got the job done but they made it harder for themselves than they should have done, didn't they? Yeah, they, they have because there's still un, underneath all of it, there, there's still many, many issues. And we've seen, for example, today the importance of Mo Salah, who, by the way, didn't score, but I mean, had his hands or legs, I should say, in just about everything, right? And the concerning issues, of course, are in a way what happens when Mo Salah leaves in January for African Cup of Nations, right? Uh, you look at Darwin Nunez, who Mo Salah set up twice. And, and that with Nunes, it depends how you look at him. Uh, in one game, you say to, to yourself, well, he's going to come good. He's going to come good. But yet he's lacking that composure. He's lacking that sophistication. Because if, you know, those two chances are being put away, we're probably not even talking about this as if it was this close. Mm -hmm. And it was a great escape to a degree. Because if Liverpool are to challenge Manchester City, and oh, by the way, Arsenal, because we need to start taking them as seriously, they can have hiccups like that. So you look at this and you look at all the possession, look at all the chances and you say to yourself well Mo Salah is not there who's going to stand up who's going to take the responsibility on the shoulders because by committee at times it looks good Mark right mm -hmm. but you're yeah. not, not always going to be able to do it by committee you need that leader and that leader is going to leave in January and this may be a big issue depending on how long uh, Egypt stays there yeah Nash, I'm glad you mentioned Darwin Nunez because He's a player that's got so much ability. He's just as likely to put one in from 30 yards as he is to miss one from three yards. And is it that inconsistency that could be a problem for Liverpool? Because with Mane and Salah, and I know Sadio Mane's been gone for a couple of years, you knew what you were getting. If one didn't score, the other one did. Or if they both had a bad game, Firmino would usually get in there. Is the problem here that, yes, Salah is setting up Darwin Nunes a lot of times. You just don't know what you're going to get when he's inside that 18-yard box. Yes, I, I still think that in some way he's not a complete striker. Uh, I mean, he can be, but he's not sophisticated, uh, as I've mentioned. He's in some ways inadequate uh, in terms of his uh, pure technique. He's strong, his work ethic is great, and he's going to get some goals. But I just don't think that uh, when it's all said and done, we're going to be talking about a player that's going to give you consistently 25, 30 goals. Well, that's that's asking a lot, I suppose. But, you know, when you when you look at Salah, mm -hmm. when you look at uh, Harry Kane, uh, when you look at Erling Haaland, he's not that. He doesn't absolutely have to be because, as we know, Luis Diaz is going to get his share. He's had his share of troubles uh, off the pitch as well. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, so he's going to be fine. But, yes, all in all, I don't think this Liverpool uh, team can depend on Darwin Nunez. He's going to be fine. He's going to do a lot for Liverpool. But I just think that uh, he's just short on on, on that, that great composure that we talk about when we talk about yeah. great strikers. Cody Gakpo was among the goals in midweek. Playing in that kind of number nine, that false nine position, 
Jurgen Klopp at his press conference on Friday pretty much said, look, if I want a number nine, I'm going to pick Darwin over Cody Gakpo. But is it something that they might look at when Mohamed Salah goes back to Africa in January to try and find some semblance of can you play Darwin? Can you play Cody Gakpo? If Diogo Jota's back, Luis Diaz as well. Shobazlai, there's a lot going on there. What would be the best formation, do you think, if and when Mohamed Salah is unavailable? Well, it's easy for Jurgen Klopp in many ways because uh, Cody Gakpo has said that he's willing to play just about anywhere. Uh, so that's good. And it's good to know that he, he's capable of playing in those positions and playing, uh, playing well. That's that's key. But I think we all know that Jurgen Klopp is not convinced about Darren Nunes. We saw that early in the season. And right now he's given him all the chances. And, and most of the time he's not taking advantage of them. Uh, at least I think that. So, I mean, if, if we see uh, Cody Gakpo lead in the line or somebody else, for that matter, I don't think any of us should be uh, surprised uh, that midfield is still uh, you know uh, not maybe at a level that it needs to be we've seen the struggles of of uh, of Sobos Uh and you know great goals today absolutely I mean if you look at McAllister uh, yeah. by himself you know the back line look at I mean Matip is injured again which is not a surprise uh, I suppose we'll see how long it takes so there's still a lot of issues in Liverpool uh, I think they know themselves that they're lucky to be where they are which is a massive positive because if they do put it together then I think you can talk or maybe then we can talk about a proper challenge to Manchester City if you think that they're mm -hmm. the front runners Trent Alexander-Arnold's free kick has gone down as an own goal with the Premier League. However, you're not taking away the one that he scored late on. Do you like him in this new position that he seems to be playing, having done that at the end of last season? Yeah, of course I do. I mean, with him, you take the good with the bad. And, and you see the first goal, it's absolutely outstanding, something that we know he's very much capable of from a free kick. That second one, what can you say? I mean, timing mm -hmm. is everything. And it, it's, you know, he's the hero. But, you know, I still, in the back of my mind, uh, think of him that you take the good with the bad, right? Because the first goal... Uh, I think there was Harry Wilson on that near post. I mean, he's got to close that. He's got to be sliding. He's got to be desperate to make sure that uh, it doesn't go on a near post uh, there because he was the closest one. He's got to react. And I think we're going to see that. And it's, uh, I mean, I don't want to say that he's lucky, but I think we do give him benefit of the doubt because these days, yes, defending is the most important thing if you have to be a defender. And let's face it, he is that without the ball. So I don't think we're going to take the responsibility away from him just because he gives you so much going forward. But what he does give you going forward, I still think outweighs some of some of his uh, deficiencies, uh, deficiencies uh, defensively. Because how many, how many truly fullbacks, because that's what he is, you know, mm -hmm. that do so much? Yeah, a lot. He does so much. However, defensively against better sides, that might be something that Jurgen Klopp has to think about, conceding three goals to Fulham. Just before we got on to the Chelsea-Brighton game, Fulham aren't going to get many headlines from this. They would have done if they'd held on at 3-2 up. What do you make of them right now under Marco Silva? Uh, Fulham, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, they're... <sighs> I think they're the sort of team that showed us, showed us last year that when all concentration is in and they always feel that need or want and stay in the Premier League. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody forgets that they've been a yo-yo team so far. And last season, I think, pretty similar, right? Great start. And once they sort of knew uh, that they're staying, then, you know, I, I don't want to say they were in, in the flip-flops, but it seemed that way towards the end of the season. So uh, is there a next level to Fulham? I would like to see that this season, for example, with this start, which isn't bad, of course. I, I don't think they're looking over their shoulder just yet, although it's it's pretty close. Uh, I, I think I, I'm looking at them to solidify themselves, uh, I think, you know, somewhere mid-table, somewhere uh, where maybe we start talking about Fulham, maybe pushing on, maybe asking questions of, uh, of Conference League. Okay, Chelsea 3, Brighton 2. It was, it was another game full of drama, Chelsea going 2-0 up, thanks to goals from set plays, and then the man wearing the captain's armband, having already been booked, saw a second yellow. Where do you want to start with this one? It finished Chelsea 3, Brighton 2. This, this could have been anything after Gallagher got sent off. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those games that's weird, right? Because, I mean, Chelsea yeah. have won, and they'll take that, especially mm -hmm. after what happened uh, what happened against Newcastle, right? I mean, it's sort of this up and down way of Chelsea where you're trying to make out who they are, what they are, how good they are. And at the end of the day, even with this win, I think nothing more of them uh, than a, a mid-table team, 
that they are right now because there's nothing special about this team. Again, I was more disappointed with Chelsea than the fact that they've won. So it's it's kind of hard for us to to maybe for me to have a go at them because uh, wins are wins. They, uh, but I just don't know where they are. I didn't see that spirit that I I saw from Liverpool. I saw two set pieces, two nil, where I felt that they needed to go after after that and show some energy, close the game down, make people forget about uh, uh, that loss. And I didn't see any of that. In fact, it was a it was an open invitation for a Brighton team that's decimated, just like Chelsea. When I say decimated, mm -hmm. not only injuries, no left uh, fullbacks, right? Because uh, uh, you see Lamptey and Estupinian not there. Uh, you're talking about three, four key players being on the bench because on Thursday, now, mind you, Brighton are in Europe, not Chelsea, who mm -hmm. have had the whole week to, pre to prepare for this. And, you know, this is Brighton that won away in Athens, our second to uh, Olympic Marseille in Europe. And, and for some reason, we think Chelsea should be better, but they're not. I don't think they are getting better in, in many ways. I was very, very disappointed. Again, in discipline. Last week, Reese James, the captain, yep. gets sent off. This week, you have Conor Gallagher, the captain, getting sent off. Last week, that in discipline, silly fouls, 19 of them. This week, 16 of them. I didn't see anything that I liked, to be quite honest. And I don't think their fans did. It was like a church. I mean, it is Sunday after all, but... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> just, just uh, Mark, I mean, they are so, so far away from the Chelsea that I think we remember and their fans want them to be. Interesting you mentioned that, Janish, and I want to, I want to follow up on that because it's a really good point. John Terry, captain, leader, legend. The banner is still there every home game. I think I'm right in saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that Reese James, when sent off last week, was wearing the captain's armband. So if that's the case, that's back-to-back -back weeks right, where the man who's meant to be leading by example doesn't. is just reckless. Reese James last week, slightly different this week for Conor Gallagher because it was two tackles for him that did for him. But does that tell us something about the, the club in general, that the leadership needs to be better? Because without that, they're just a, a ragtag bunch of expensive, decent players that don't have much leadership or guidance. Absolutely. I didn't see any of that. And, and you know, from time to time, we, we, I think most of us kind of won, you know, I don't want to say won, but we just imagined this Chelsea that it's eventually because it's Chelsea for no other reason than that. And we can sit here and talk about how many young players, how many uh, players came in and it take, takes time. But I think, you know, Pochettino has to take responsibility for that because I don't think these players are responding either uh, in a way that you, you'd imagine because, you know, I look at that team and we talk about front lines, right? And I was thinking the other day, and I look at Jackson, I look at Sterling, Mudrick, Gallagher, and even Cole Palmer, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, they're nowhere near the front lines of the top teams. I'm talking Liverpool, Manchester City. I'm talking Arsenal. I could probably throw in their Spurs, maybe Villa, maybe for sure even uh, Newcastle. And you say to yourself how good they really are because, you know, people are going to tell us that it takes time. There's so much talent in young players. And I don't see it. And the leadership, you know, comes from that. I think comes from confidence uh, as well, obviously. But this is a team that kind of feels like randomly goes out there week in and week out and gives us a little bit of hope, a, a game against, say, Arsenal. But then, right, the, you know, the, that leadership collapses, right? 2-0, great game. You say to yourself, oh, maybe they're getting somewhere. Then you look at Manchester City, 4-4, okay, defensively a disaster. But four goals against City, a good result. And then comes game like this. So I've, it's a bit weird for me to talk about it because at the end of the day, they won. But but again, this Brighton team almost came back. I wouldn't have given that penalty. I think it was a wrong decision. You've mentioned Caicedo should have been uh, seen a second yellow card. And it almost feels like <laughs> they lost the game. Apologies, Chelsea fans. But that's the way I see it. I don't see really any progress that's going to materialize anytime soon. Not even with Nkunku coming back from a knee injury over the next week or two? Christ, too bad that you made that point and not me because I had it written <laughs> I had it written down. Unless, of course, Nkunku changes that, which I suppose is possible. We saw him mm -hmm. here in the United States, Mark, uh, in the preseason. He looked the part. We know what yep. he's capable of doing. So I suppose uh, uh, that could change the equation uh, from a talented player like that. But, I mean, 
it would change my opinion about where they stand in terms of front lines, but I don't think it's going to change anything in terms of where Chelsea are going to be at the end of the season. And the other two early games, West Ham had the lead through Kudus. However, Palace fought back to earn a point at the London Stadium. And in the other game, it was quite a topsy-turvy encounter. This one, Bournemouth against Villa. Bournemouth had taken the lead, thought they went 2-1 down, but a VAR chopped that off. Solanke put them 2-1 up, and then late on, Ollie Watkins with the equaliser. So the early four games in the Premier League, producing a whole host of goals. I think 18 in the four games. That's rather impressive. There's full midweek card coming up as well. It's getting to the festive time. You get some funky results, but Liverpool managed to pull it out when they were 3-2 down with three minutes to go and get all three points. Chelsea doing likewise despite being down to 10 men. Thanks to Janusz. Bye for now.